It's always been good advice to get a decent night's sleep, but as modern life seems increasingly wired up to interfere with that, recent research is demonstrating just how critical sleep is, not just to feeling refreshed in the morning, but also for your overall health. Joining us now to explain, John Peaver. He is Vice President of Research at the Canadian Sleep Society and a professor in Cell and Systems Biology at the University of Toronto. And David Sampson is here. He's an Assistant Professor of Biological Anthropology also at the U of T. Good to have you two gentlemen here, looking so rested, I may say, as well. <laughs> Let's, uh, David, I actually want to read a little snippet here of something you wrote with Charles Nunn. Uh, here we go. Sleep occupies approximately one-third of a typical human lifespan. Deviations from this standard are linked to cognitive impairment and negative health consequences. For example, sleep is critical for working memory, attention, decision-making, and visual motor performance. Sleep loss driven by access to artificial lighting, shift work, and increased international travel, has societal costs, ranging from decreases in workplace productivity to fatal accidents. This suggests, you say a third, this suggests, David, that we need eight hours sleep a night. Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody who gets eight hours a night. Right. So how much sleep do we truly need? Yeah, it's a fascinating question, and it appears as though there are two emerging uh, narratives to help explain the right answer to this question. So. For the past 50 years in a post-industrial context, we have sleep labs that have been showing empirically that there's been a trend line with the reduction of total sleep duration and sleep quality for people sleeping in Western post-industrial environments. Now, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, we have emerging research from biological anthropology, so this is the group that I've been working with as a biological anthropologist, that have shown that in other societies, in traditional societies that are sleeping in contexts that differ drastically from Western contexts, small-scale agriculturalists or even hunter-gatherers, in these societies, they're sleeping even less, and their sleep quality is generally of less quality as well. So if you were to put my feet to the fire and you force me to give an average, say a species average, mm -hmm. I would, what I would want to do is get a cross-section of all these cultures and then get an average. And that it seems to be that there's this converging value around seven hours that we're getting from this. Now, that being said, the way that sleep is expressed within a 24-hour cycle, this is actually quite flexible. So in the West, we have this sort of lie down and die model where it's a big monophasic chunk of sleep at night and then you wake up because you gotta be functioning from nine to five. Mm -hmm. In a hunter-gatherer culture though, there may be much more flexibility in terms of when you can express your daytime activity and your nighttime sleep. So I could get five overnight and then maybe a two hour nap in the afternoon? Exactly. And that works. Exactly. Okay. But still, there's an importance on this seven hour value. Gotcha. John, uh, you know, it's been alluded to in David's piece there about what the negative consequences are of inadequate sleep. Are they really that dramatic? They can be extraordinarily dramatic. Um, sleep loss is probably one of the most leading causes of traffic accidents. We've all heard about Exxon, Exxon Valdez. There's multiple examples. You know what, of... so, some of the people who are watching this program were not alive when the Exxon Valdez had its accident. So maybe you should just fill us in on that. So the, the captain of the Exxon Valdez fell asleep at the wheel, so to speak. That was an oil tanker. An oil tanker and it crashed. It dumped its entire uh, load of oil into the ocean, one of the biggest natural disasters in history, all stemming from the loss of appropriate sleep. He was sleep deprived. He was sleep deprived. If I get four hours one night, but then I get 10 the next, am I still okay? Uh, that's not an ideal scenario. You, you really want to have a, one of the most important things in terms of getting a good night of sleep. We're not looking at sleep over many nights, uh, is to have a consistent amount of sleep each and every night. So seven hours appears to be, for all intents and purposes, the, the target amount that most people need. And if you don't get it, can you catch up? You can catch up, there is evidence. Your brain is incredibly well designed to help you catch up. So we've all had that night of going out late, and losing a good night of sleep, and what happens the next day? We are sleepy, we try to sleep in. And if we can do it, that's great, because you catch up on your excess sleep. But if you're not able to do it, then the nasty side effects of sleep loss catch up with you. More on that in a second. David, let's go back to that piece we just mm. quoted from Evolutionary Anthropology and do another excerpt here. Mm. Human sleep differs substantially from that of other primates. We are exceptionally short sleepers, and we pack a higher proportion of REM sleep into our short sleep durations. 
it appears that evolution has whittled away sleep durations, just as access to electricity and lighting continues to do so in the present day. What evolutionary factors have led us to shorter, more efficient sleep? Yeah, that's a great question, one I've been focused on for the past five years. So you have to, it sort of begs the question, why do we sleep in the first place, right? Because there's so many other things that we could be doing that are incredibly valuable, like from an evolutionary standpoint, looking for a mate, getting food, shoring up social alliances, learning new skills. There's all these things we can do besides sleep. So there's always been this tension and all things being equal, you would want as, want as high a quality sleep as possible so you would have more time to do these things. It turns out that for humans, the real big event occurred probably around the advent of our genus. So Homo erectus, this was the first hominin that was a full-time terrestrial hominin. You had australopithecines that were in the trees generally and they could, they could sleep up there as well, most likely. So something really interesting happened when the first humans came to the ground. You had, first of all, you didn't have the vagaries of being blown out of a, a tree, tree nest, right? So you didn't have to worry about that. And many anthropologists posit that there was the controlled use of fire. So you would have had a sleep site that was thermoregulated. The smoke could have provided a fumigant for insects, uh, could have deterred predators. But I think one of the really critical things, and this is some of the work that uh, myself and my colleagues have done with Hadza Hunter Gathers, we show that you have a sentinelized sleep environment. So a, which? a sentinelized, meaning? where meaning you have people that are awake at any given ep epoch during the night. In fact, we found, and it was really quite shocking, we found that the average was seven adults were awake at any given minute in this community of about 30 adults. So you have an environment here that really facilitates high quality sleep because the safety of that sleep site is increasing. And so that might have been one of the watershed events that allowed for us to reduce our total sleep times, yet get jam in that that really high quality deep sleep. Lock on the front door, basically do that today? That's the idea. That is sentinel yeah. sentinelized spe yeah. uh, sleep for today. <laughs> Has there been a price to pay for our reduced sleep needs? Yeah, so this is a principle of evolutionary biology. There's never a perfect system. There's always a trade-off, right? So when you reduce sleep, um, there may be some costs. In fact, there have been some potential costs associated uh, with short sleep in modern humans in that you might be more vulnerable to cognitive decline. Uh, Alzheimer's might be indicated in this as well because when uh, you don't get enough sleep, one of the functions of sleep is to use cerebral spinal fluid to come in and clear out the interstitial tissues of your brain of this plaque, it's called beta amyloid. And it's been associated with Alzheimer's. So it could be that evolution by whittling away our total sleep times made us more vulnerable to this. Because remember, evolution doesn't care what you do after you reproduce. So in old age, it doesn't care if you have cognitive decline because you've already contributed your genes to the gene pool. Hmm. John, we are at the time of year when we spring forward as opposed to fall back. And I want you to talk to us about, well, I heard about this. 70,000 people in Finland apparently signed a, pe a petition and MPs agreed to lobby the European Union to do away with daylight savings time because they thought it messed up our circadian rhythms and all of that kind of thing and just made us uh, less well-functioning. Uh, how, how much of an impact does Spring Forward have on our typical sleep patterns? So we, as I alluded to before, we were very aware that even a subtle change in the amount of sleep that you have each night has an impact on your behavior. Um, I'll give your listeners a very good example. There was a beautiful study in which they took two groups of people. One, they gave the rhinovirus, and they didn't let them sleep as much as they normally would. The rhinovirus is the, is the virus that causes the common cold. Um, the other group, uh, they let them have a normal night of sleep, and what they found is that you're three times more likely to develop the cold after you've been inoculated with the virus when you had less sleep. Hmm. John, let me ask you about our beloved Toronto, well, beloved uh, Toronto Maple Leafs to those of us who live in southern Ontario, maybe not so beloved in eastern Ontario or southwestern. But if, for example, when the Leafs go on a road trip and they got to go play the Vancouver Canucks and the San Jose Sharks and the Los Angeles Kings and so on, and they are now three hours, not just daylight savings time, one hour, but three hours off of their regular sleep patterns, uh, it's a given that they're not going to play as well on the West Coast? It, it's it, it, one of the things that athletes actually try to do is is to avoid jet lag, 
But of course, in, in the Toronto Maple Leafs, they don't have that luxury of being able to accommodate themselves to jet lag. But absolutely, there's great scientific evidence uh, showing that a subtle change of, of an hour uh, in losing a night of sleep, uh, an hour of sleep each night can impact the, the ability to score goals and perform well. What's your view on getting rid of daylight savings time? Uh, I <clears throat> personally, I don't really have a, a horse in that race. Um, I will say though that light has profound effect on sleep biology. Um, light and temperature are the, the principal zeitgevers, or these entrainment factors that really regulate our sleep wake activity. So even bumping it around an hour is going to have a profound effect, like John said. Hmm. So when the kids come to you and you say, I can't go to bed, it's still light outside. Yeah. They're not just faking it. That actually is true. It's going to have an effect. It's going to have an effect. Okay, let's, let me get you guys to look at the monitor up there. And John, take us through this, because this is the human sleep cycle. And I wonder if you'll just help us understand what's significant about this chart. So um, what I think is really important to recognize, and many people don't realize that you, your brain actually and your body are going through a very specific uh, number of cycles each night. So you simply don't put your head on the pillow, lights out, and you wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, your brain in particular goes through various uh, cycles of sleep. So you start out in that light, dozy sleep. You then enter into these deeper stages of sleep called deep sleep or slow wave sleep. And it's really thought that those deep phases of slow wave sleep are what the brain and the body really require to restore itself and regenerate the damage from the waking day. But after you've been in this deep stage of sleep, you then cycle back to the lighter stages, back to the deep cycle, and then eventually you enter about 90 minutes later into rapid eye movement or dreaming sleep. And then that cycle repeats between deep sleep, dreaming sleep, deep sleep, dreaming sleep. And for the typical adult, you are having three, four, five cycles a night? About eight cycles a night. Eight in fact. cycles yes. a night. So. Huh. And is this desirable? in terms of having feeling rested by the time morning comes. So yeah, absolutely. Disrupting that cycle is probably one of the key things that goes wrong when you lose a night of sleep or you have disturbed sleep, as many people with insomnia or other um, anxiety disorders have a, a, a change in that cycle. It's that, that change in the, the distribution of the deep sleep and the dreaming sleep that may well lead to the the cognitive and behavioral impairments that we see when you're and it, sleep lost. And also, John, I think it's worth piggybacking on this and bringing in the evolutionary narrative. So as we know, humans have the shortest total sleep time, but we also have the highest proportion of REM jammed into that sleep time. So this is deep sleep and the arousal threshold for this, meaning it's really hard to wake you up during this period, is very high. So this really underscores how unique human sleep is relative to other animals. Because we have all this vulnerable sleep, we really needed to figure out ways to make sure that when we were asleep, we were safe. David talked to us earlier about how the plaque beta amyloids, yeah, beta amyloid, yeah. how that potentially without good sleep could lead to, for example, Alzheimer's. What have you learned through your research um, about how sleep can predict one's future health? So uh, as David was talking about, my area of research is in, in what causes uh, REM sleep. How does the brain generate this dreaming state? And one of the best predictors of future health problems is a disruption in REM sleep. So there is a disorder called REM sleep behavior disorder, which is quite remarkable in that when you and I would go into our dreaming stage or REM sleep, we were, our muscles would be quieted and we wouldn't move. But in people with REM sleep behavior disorder, that process is lost and they physically act out their dreams. And that might sound innocuous, but the problem is, is that 80 to 90% of those people who have REM sleep behavior disorder, those that move around during their dreaming sleep, go on to develop a neurodegenerative disease. When you say they act out their dreams, what do you mean? Uh, they act out their dreams in the sense that if they're dreaming about kicking a football, they kick the football. If they're dreaming about jumping over a barrel, they jump over a barrel. You're saying while they're in bed? While they're in bed. They are leaping they are leaping. The number one problem with these individuals that brings their attention to the fact that they have a, 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 this disorder is that they usually hurt themselves or the person that they sleep with. And cuts, deep bruises, and even broken bones, bones are common in people with REM sleep behavior disorder. So that's how severe the dream and acting behaviors are. Is there a connection between that and sleep apnea? Uh, 
REM sleep behavior disorder can, uh, uh, sleep apnea can mask as REM sleep behavior disorder because in sleep apnea, effectively what happens is the muscles in your upper airway become too relaxed, the airway closes, and then you can't breathe. You can't breathe. So right. you have apnea. That's the definition of apnea. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, you actually arouse and you will move. So people with uh, sleep apnea will sort of will move during sleep, but they're moving to re-energize their airway to open it so that they stop the apnea. But this is entirely different than people with REM sleep behavior disorder who physically act out their dreams. And I just want to add that REM sleep behavior disorder would have been something that evolution would have not allowed if you were a sleeping ape in a tree, right? <laughs> so it was probably something that happened a little bit after we came to the ground. I have heard people described who, who are suffering from sleep apnea. I have heard them described as looking dead, mm. right? I mean, they're not breathing, the airways are constricted, and they look as if they have expired. Mm. Is that, uh, does that jive with what your knowledge of it is as well? Well, what I do know about sleep apnea is that it's uh, probably linked with obesity. There's some experimental evidence indicating that there is an association there. And when it comes to bringing evolution into the narrative here, um, so there's this concept of evolutionary mismatch. That is, our bodies are hardwired for how things were and not how things are today, mm -hmm. right? And so this classic example with obesity is um, in the West, we have access to all these processed sugars and fats, and we have, therefore, a, an obesity epidemic. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the case, then really what's going on is our diet, our runaway diet is affecting our sleep because it's influencing the rates of insomnia. Interesting. Yeah. I managed to get through the first five decades of my life without knowing anybody who had sleep apnea, John. Mm. And now I know tons of people who've got it. And they're not obese, not all mm. of them. What's going on here? So it, it's a, it, it, obesity is a major contributing factor to sleep apnea. But there are other contributing factors, one of which is some people are naturally predisposed to have a tiny airway. And when you have a tiny airway, it just makes it uh, more likely that it can collapse while you're sleeping to produce sleep apnea. So while obesity is, is obviously a, a major factor, the, the fat accumulates around the airway and pushes it shut when the muscles relax as they normally do when you sleep. Um, certainly, um, there are certain people with just small airways that, that have sleep apnea. And what is, I, I know, you know, some people have told me they gotta put that mask on overnight and they hate doing that. Some people just can't do it. If you can't wear the mask, what do you do? There's lots of, uh, the mask is certainly uh, the best treatment and it functions basically like a vacuum cleaner in reverse. The mask is on your face and it pushes air in there and it puffs out the airway so it can't collapse. Um, but there are a lot of people with these anatomical defects, you can actually use what's called med mandibular advancement or jaw advancement. Mm -hmm. And what the advancement of the jaw does is help open the airway. So there are uh, alternative treatments to uh, the mask for treatment of sleep apnea. Because some folks just can't do it. Some people have a really hard time. Yeah, yeah. David, okay, we've heard about his take on sure. REM sleep. I want to get your take now. Mm -hmm. What has your research taught you about the importance of REM or dreaming sleep for modern humans? Yeah, so REM is just, it's one of these really compelling topics, right? Because one of the most common times in which the frequency with which we dream is during REM sleep ar architecture. So um, dreaming is one of these topics people love talking about. And when I was doing research with the Hadza Hunter Gathers, for example, I actually recorded some of their dream narratives. And it's interesting because in the West, we sort of had this, have this casual relationship with our dreams. We can have a very powerful dream. And by the time we're checking email uh, the next morning, we've already completely forgotten it, right? But there was one example where a, um, a Hadza hunter who was an elder in the group, and I was recording his dream, and he mentioned that he had been ambushed in his dream by a leopard and while he was hunting. And so it was because of this that he was not going to go out into the bush for the next two days, right? So it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks that for these people, there is a direct relationship between their dreaming lives and the lives they have when they're, when they're awake. It affects their behavior. That's where I don't think you or I could, you know, have a dream about us getting hit by a car and then calling our boss and saying, hey, I'm not coming in for the week, right? <laughs> Do you dream? Yeah, yeah. Do you I, remember I dream. your dreams when you wake up? I, as part of, so I was doing this protocol. I love doing the kind of science that I do with other people on myself. So I've recorded about 60 of my dreams. Yeah, in the same way that uh, I record when I'm in the field. Recorded them how? Uh, they are dream surveys. So you ask very specific questions about the place of the dream, 
um, the people in the dream, if there were any notable events or actions, the emotional content, the emotional valence of the dream. And uh, Domhoff is a, is a researcher who's made a, a career out of scientifically quantifying dream content. So what I hope to do is sort of a global cross-cultural analysis of dreams, kind of comparing Western versus traditional society dreams. Cool. This, it seems to me, is a very timely question, sleeping pills. If you can't get the seven to eight hours every night that you two both say we need, should you take a sleeping pill? There's good evidence to suggest that sleeping pills certainly help a, 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 a small group of people who need to get a good night of sleep. But there's equal evidence to suggest that people who take sleeping pills have a shortened lifespan. Um, so if you looked at the, the odds of, of how long you would live in those who aren't taking sleeping pills but have insomnia, they are longer than the people who have insomnia and take sleeping pills to correct their insomnia. Hmm. So I would leave it up to your listeners to uh, decide for themselves on that question. In traditional societies that you have studied, what strategies do they use? Because there obviously aren't, uh, there are not pharmacological solutions like we have today. Yeah. To deal with insomnia. Yeah, so it's funny because when you ask them about the, whether or not they're happy with their sleep quality, it's resoundingly they are, which is interesting because they're getting less sleep and more fragmented sleep. Hmm. Um, so I think the way to answer that is to look at circadian biology holistically. What we're seeing is that they get less total sleep time, but in fact, their circadian rhythms are more in sync with their environment, huh. which is kind of surprising. Um, so again, we talk about those principal uh, entrainment factors like light and temperature. I think this, what it tells us is that we, as people sleeping in the West, we should really get more of an exposure to our environment so we can synchronize with our environment and th there's gonna be a host of positive health outcomes if we do this. Uh, so those who work shift work, say overnight shifts, yeah. they're really at risk for lousy are, sleep. The science behind this is pretty resounding, yeah. We've also been told numerous times, don't put your smartphone beside your bed because yes. you're gonna be tempted to look at it and yep. the light from the screen is gonna mess you up and all of that. Yep. Talk to us about the connection between a good night's sleep and light. Light is critical. Um, one of the things I actually do, since I've been uh, reading this literature, one of the things I like to do is as soon as the sun goes down, I'll turn off as many lights as possible in the house. And this is supposed to help promote melatonin production. Melatonin is the principal hormone that regulates sleep-wake activity. Another thing I do, particularly since in uh, a pastime of mine is video gaming, and video gamers are one of the worst sleeping segments of our society, mm -hmm. is I'll throw on, here I got a prop, I was told to bring in a prop, so. <laughs> I'll throw in these blue wave light blocking glasses, and uh, I'm not being paid by any company to, to uh, plug these, but what they do is they block the blue wave light, and it allows for natural melatonin production to occur. Uh, gamers are really at risk for this because they're in front, they're hunched over in front of these LCD screens that are blasting blue wave light on them, and they're in these really competitive environments, right? So they're in socially competitive environments, their cortisol spiked, mm -hmm. their, uh, their, their entire neuroendocrine system is, is primed for performance, and then they turn the computer off and think they're gonna fall asleep, and it's just not gonna not happen. Gonna happen. Nope. Those glasses look yeah. like any other glasses, mm -hmm. and the lenses do too, but yeah. they're not. They have a little bit of a yellow tinge to them, but they're blocking <laughs> about 40% of the blue wave light in the room right now. Okay, what's... Um... What's a better option here? Convincing people to give up using their devices in the evening to avoid all of the trouble that David just mentioned, or make devices that are less sleep disruptive? Uh, you know, the, the ideal scenario is, is the former. It's to give up using these devices before you go to sleep, because David pointed it out very nicely, that the light emitted from you know, your phones and computers and tablets um, they effectively wake up the brain. They trick it into thinking it's time to be awake when it's really time to sleep. Um, obviously, the glasses that are, have been developed are useful because they help reduce the blue light in particular that is stimulating to the brain. So that's, you know, the, the both solutions are the best fix is really giving up your devices, but glasses are much more likely the way that most people will actually benefit. Is there any good excuse at three o'clock in the morning to take a look at your smartphone? I'm not sure of one myself, but I'm <laughs> sure that there are a lot of people who need to check out what the President of the United States is tweeting <laughs> well, at three o'clock in the morning. Point. He might be kofefeing at that hour of the night, <laughs> exactly. or who knows what. 
That's a good point. But basically, if you want a good night's sleep, keep that screen away from you all night long. Keep, it's, it's particularly disastrous to be looking at the, sc the screen in the middle of the night because, as David was alluding to, the, the brain is very carefully orchestrated to have a rhythm. And it's a wake rhythm and a sleep rhythm. And the light starts to signal the, the wake cells in the brain to, to, to wake up, and they suppress the cells that get you to sleep. Where's your smartphone when you go to bed? My smartphone is in another room. And yours, David? In another room, too. Uh, uh, before, an hour before bed is what the science is showing. We should not be using our cell phones. We shouldn't be looking at LCD screens, either. So read, a actually read a, a hardcover book. Because the e-readers, the science is showing, also e-readers are the problem. same problem. For goodness sakes. Okay. So we have a reason to keep books around. Look at that. Besides the fact that they make us brilliant. Of course. <laughs> they help us get to sleep better, too. Yeah. Terrific. Gents, this was great. Sweet dreams to both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank John you. Peaver, VP Research, Canadian Sleep Society. David R. Sampson, System Professor, Department of Anthropology, University of Toronto. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.